Hey everyone, Tactics here with yet another Season 1 Mythic Plus Guide for Dragonflight, this time taking a look at the Noku Defensive, covering topics like important interrupts, dispels, stops, and purges, boss mechanics, and even a simple, easy to execute thundering route that will be great for pugging early on in the season. A few of these guide videos are already out at this point, with the rest very soon on their way, and once the season actually starts, I'll be posting a lot of other Mythic Plus related content, such as advanced guides, as well as high key walkthroughs from a tank's perspective, so if that sounds like something you want to watch, be sure you do subscribe to the channel down below and click on that bell so you don't miss a video. Now buckle up, cause this is gonna be a while, as this is the longest dungeon available in Season 1, with a timer on the beta of 40 minutes. Right off the bat, you realize right away just how gigantic this dungeon is, and of course, to traverse it, you will be using Dragonflight's brand new Dragon Riding. Luckily, this is pretty forgiving in this dungeon. Your Vigor regens very, very quickly in here, and there are a ton of like tornadoes located around the dungeon that you can use to get some additional altitude. To start, I recommend heading towards Granith and the Centaur Warriors patrolling around that area, and there are quite a few different ones here. So the Nokud War Spear, they just have Pierce, which is a bleed on your tank, as well as Swift Stab, which is a random target charge, which also puts a bleed on them. Neither of these are stoppable, so you just kind of have to deal with these whenever you have a War Spear. Longbows have multi-shot. This is actually a full tank frontal. Uh, it does not follow the tank, so you can sidestep it, but whenever there's a longbow in the group, and sometimes there are multiple and opposite ends of packs, which can be quite annoying, just be aware of that cone. They also have a rain of arrows, which is just a channeled series of swirlies that they shoot out. You can stop this as well, but it's not really that important. The swirlies are quite easy to dodge. What you will for sure want to stop, though, is the No Good Horn Sounder and their Rally the Clan ability. If this does go off, it puts a 50% damage increase in rage on everything nearby. So make sure you do stop this. If it happens to go through, try and soothe as many as you can, but really, really want to stop that. No Good Beastmasters are also in this area. They also come with a pet, and they will apply Hunter's Mark to a random player. This player is going to be taking a little bit extra damage during this pull, so just be careful of that or they'll also apply an Enrage to their pet with Hunt Prey. You can stop this, or you can soothe it off of their pet, otherwise they get a 200% damage increase. There are some bigger guys, uh, Lieutenant Mobs, that are patrolling around this area as well. They're called Nilkud Plane Stompers, and they just have an Interrupt and Disruptive Shout. This is a 40-yard party hit, so make sure you do kick this. And they also have War Stomp, which is just an 8-yard AoE around the mob that will stun you and deal some physical damage if you're hit. There are three mini bosses you need to kill in this area to unlock the boss. Those are Nokud Lance Masters. They have the two same abilities as the Plane Stomper, so Disruptive Shout and War Stomp, and they also have a passive buff on them in Cleaving Strikes, where all of their auto attacks are frontals, so make sure these guys are always faced away from your group. Once you've defeated all three of these Lance Masters and then used the Dragon Killer Lances, near where you fought them, the dragon Granith will hop down and you'll be able to engage him. When this fight begins, you'll notice one of these three lances will begin charging up, and that is very important as this charging lance will be the only way for you to stop his eruption ability, a massive unavoidable party hit which the boss will cast when he reaches 100 energy. To prevent your group from taking this damage, you'll need one player to run over to the lance and shoot the boss before the cast completes, which will stun him for 5 seconds and do 5% of his health in damage. Once you fire a lance, another one will begin charging, so you'll need to reposition when that happens. We found it easiest to just rotate around the room towards where the new charging lance was and have the healer click on them. Granith won't just let you shoot him though, he'll intermittently spawn some Nokud saboteurs, which will just run towards the currently reloading lance and try to dismantle it. These guys are fully CC'able, so you'll want to either hard CC them away from the boss and ignore them, or keep them CC'd near the boss as long as you can so they can be cleaved down with the boss with things like stuns, roots, those kinds of things. Outside of that, Granith will just occasionally cast shards of stone, just unavoidable party it, everyone within 60 yards, as well as Tectonic Stomp, which is a 23 yard circle around the boss that deals very big damage and knocks back if you're caught inside of it. Once you've defeated Granith, you can head to the west towards some more lightning themed crash. The key here is you'll need to defeat four Storm Surge totems. These totems just constantly shoot out three yard swirlies when you're engaged with the pack nearby, and on death they will cast Storm Surge, which is a six yard AoE around them you'll want to avoid. These are always joined with a Storm Caller mob. These guys are lieutenants, just like the Lance Master mobs from the previous section, uh, but these guys have a Storm Bolt, which is a random target nature hit that you want to interrupt for sure. They have Totemic, 
Overload, which is a 100-yard AoE that shoots from the Totem, the Storm Sword Totem we just mentioned. So pretty heavy damage here, but when that happens, they will also spawn some Surge of Power Orbs from that Totem, which will deal a little bit of nature damage, but give you a stacking 5% damage and healing buff. Note that this Totemic Overload hit won't actually go off if you've killed the Storm Surge Totem, and also if you just move 100 yards away from the totem as the totem does not move. So there's a couple different strategies there, right? You can come in, you can try and burst that totem down so that the totemic overload won't do anything to you. Or sometimes we've seen as well is you can tag these storm caller mobs and then move away from that totem and kill the mobs 100 yards away so you don't get hit by that ability. Primalist storm speakers are also pretty often in these packs as well. They also have a random target nature hit that is kickable in storm bolt as well as an AoE that is channeled in tempest which is both kickable and of course stoppable as it is a channel and you will want to make sure you get this for sure as this is exceptionally deadly. They will also summon squalls. Occasionally these squalls just have one aura on them in violent dispersion and this will just kind of do a 60 yard AoE on death. So if you can kick this ability it is quite fast so it could be a challenge but if you can do this and it will mitigate a decent amount of party damage by not summoning an additional squall. The last mob usually accompanying these storm callers are the primalist arc blades. These guys just have one ability in arcing strike this is a tank hit that deals nature damage that does arc to nearby allies so when this comes out melee dps you want to make sure that you are backed up slightly away from the tank otherwise you will get cleaved if you're within six yards patrolling around this area are some primalist thunder beasts these guys have an interrupt in thunder strike another random target nature hit just kick that. They also have Chain Lightning, which is uninterruptible, and it will just target a random person, and then it'll strike an arc off of them uh, to anyone within 10 yards. So again, whoever gets this, you just kind of want to run 10 yards away from everyone else so you don't cleave anyone. Finally, these guys will just use a Thunderclap ability, 8-yard AoE around the mob. You just want to run out of that, otherwise you get hit, and you get slowed there's only one other important mob in this area and that is the primal storm shield these guys have a passive lightning cudgel where their melees do 50 percent additional damage as nature so tanks beware of that and they'll also cast storm shield which is a 25 percent hp shield they put on themselves for eight seconds which deals a party hit if it expires before being purged or destroyed so you want to make sure uh, if you don't have a purge that you put a lot of damage into this shield otherwise it is going to hurt a fair bit there's a couple less relevant mobs in this area. No good neophytes. They just only cast Stormbolt, that same a random target nature damage ability that Primal Storm Speakers did, just to kick that. And Primal Gusts, which just have these swirling gusts or on them, uh, which are just pretty weak mobs. Uh, this absorb is just like 99% of their HP, so you just purge it and they die. Once all four of the totems and storm callers are dead, you will be able to fight the raging. Tempest. You want to spread out initially here on this boss fight for a couple different reasons. First, Lightning Strike puts a 15 yard AoE around every single player, so you want to avoid cleaving these. Second, the boss will occasionally shoot out a bunch of uncontrollable energy orbs that will deal party damage and give the boss a stacking 5% damage buff if they reach him. So to prevent this, you can blow these up with the Lightning Strike Circles, or you can opt to soak them, taking a little bit of damage, but also gaining that same stacking 5% damage and healing buff that you got previously. With some smart usage of these orbs, you are actually able to maintain a very, very high uptime on this buff, as soaking another orb will fully refresh your current duration, as well as add a stack, and know that these stacks are capped at 10. At full energy, the boss will begin to channel Electrical Storm, which lasts for 15 seconds, and deals heavy nature damage to the entire group every 0.5 seconds for the entire duration. So you want to chain things like defensives, healer CDs, and party cooldowns here as well to survive. For tanks, the boss will occasionally give himself a buff in Energy Surge. This is just an attack speed increase, 100% attack speed increase, and causes their melee hits to deal additional nature damage. On top of this, whenever you move out of the melee range of the boss, the boss will instead spam Wind Burst at you, and that just deals the same total damage as a melee hit, but it's nature instead of physical. So just do be careful when you're backing away from the boss and be prepared for that extra magic damage intake. From there, you can fly to a graveyard of sorts, and yet again, you have to kill a bunch of lieutenant mobs before the boss will spawn. In this case, four soul harvesters. These soul harvesters are relatively simple. They have a death bolt 
volley that you need to interrupt. It's just going to hit the whole party for shadow damage. You want to try and keep these mobs away from the bodies of other mobs because they will occasionally cast Harvest Soul. And this just harvests the souls of any mobs within 20 yards that are dead. And anything that is within 20 yards and gets harvested will give the mob a stacking 30% shadow damage increase. So not great, especially if you ever accidentally let a death bolt volley through in for a bad time. Their only other ability is Shatter Soul, which affects a few party members, and basically a white kind of floating orby soul thing will jump out of them in a random direction and start slowly moving towards the soul harvester. For 15 seconds, those players do have a 30% damage decrease on them until they eat their soul. If the soul harvester eats the soul though, obviously you're stuck with that 15 second damage decrease and the soul harvester will gain a stack as well. So definitely make sure you pick up your soul. Patrolling around this area are desecrated Ohunas. These guys just have Rotting Wind, which is a frontal aimed at the tank, will not follow so you can step out of this. And if you do get hit, it will put a disease healing reduction on you, so try and avoid that. There's also Beast Callers. You guys have a tank hit in Heavy Slash. You also have a couple of stoppable casts in Devour Spirit and Desecrating Roar, where notably that last one is also interruptible. Devour Spirit is just an unpurgeable 100% damage done increase for 20 seconds by eating an ally that's within 100 yards. Desecrating Roar will summon three Desecrated Bakars. These mobs don't really do much, but you don't really want uh, more stuff spawned here. So just try and kick or stop that. Death Speakers are in the area as well. They have a kick in Grasp of the Dead. This is a tank targeted curse that slows with a six second dot. And if the dot lasts its full duration without being dispelled, it'll also root the target. So make sure you kick or you dispel this. They also have a stop in Chant of the Dead. This is a 10 yard AOE that'll buff any other mobs hit with a 50% damage done increase and a 50% damage taken decrease in rage effect. So you really wanna make sure you're stopping this or if it does go off, you're soothing those mobs that have been hit. Corruptors are the last big mob in this area. They have Death Bolt, this is a tank targeted shadow hit that you can interrupt. And they also have Necrotic Eruption, which is a channeled summon of multiple orbs that then explode within three yards. You can leave this casting actually, it's not the biggest deal. Uh, if there's several of these in a pack though, you may want to stop this cast just so your space doesn't get taken up by all of these orbs. A couple Risen mobs are also in this area. There's the Risen Warrior that'll just mortal strike your tank. This is stoppable as well though, so you may want to do that just so that healing reduction isn't messing with your tank. And then the Risen Mystic has Swift Wind. This is interruptible, this is stoppable, and this is also purgeable as it puts out a 20% haste buff. So do one of those three things. After the four soul harvesters are killed, you move on to Tira and Maruk. And note that these two bosses do share a health pool, so you get some good value out of cleaving here. You also have to keep them close together anyways, as if they're more than 20 yards apart, they will both begin gaining a stacking 5% damage increase until they are within 20 yards again. To make keeping them together a bit more difficult, Tira will sometimes use Spirit Leap. This just jumps her away to a nearby location, which is designated with a misty white indicator. As a tank here, when this happens, immediately start moving towards that area with Maruk, and you'll be able to minimize their damage buff. Both bosses also have a special ability upon them reaching full energy. Tira will use Gale Arrow, which marks everyone but the tank, then after a big initial nature hit on them, shoots out four tornadoes from each player that both travel outwards a fair distance and then come back inwards to their initial position. Note that as of the latest beta testing for this ability, you could safely stack up with this debuff as the tornado hits had a bit of a grace period before they would murder you, so if this still works, it would make dodging these tornadoes much, much easier. When Maruk reaches full energy, he'll use Earth Splitter. This shoots out four lines of swirlies at random players that deal big physical damage if hit and leave an aftershock puddle for five seconds that you'll want to stay out of. On top of this, Maruk also has Frightful Roar, which is just a 15 yard AoE fear that you'll want to step out of. Outside of these abilities, Tira just spams Quick Shot throughout the fight, dealing random target physical damage, and Maruk will occasionally use Brutalize on the tank, which is just a big physical hit. Once Tira and Maruk are down, you'll be able to make your way towards the hold where Balakar Khan is located. There's a lot of trash kind of patrolling down in a line from the entrance of his hold towards where the boss is himself, but most of it is actually skippable. Do note here that there is a, a bit of a field both within the hold and around it where you aren't able to dragon ride. Uh, so if you do start dragon riding, you'll be teleported all the way back to the front of the hold. So do not do that. The big lieutenant mobs here are no good defenders. Very similar to those mobs at the beginning of the dungeon uh, where they have that cleaving strikes buff. So their auto attacks are 
frontals. They also have that war stomp, eight yard AOE, and they have a new kick in blood curdling shout, which is a 200 yard party hit uh, if you don't kick it, and it'll make a six second magic fear on everyone in the party as well. So you definitely want to kick that, otherwise it's very likely a wipe. The only other new trash mob in this area is the Nokud Thunderfist. These guys just have Storm Shock, which is a random target nature hit that puts a stacking four second magic dot on them as well, as well as Deadly Thunder, which is a massive tank hit and nature damage with a knockback attached to it. Both these are kickable, so make sure you do that. Then there are two mini bosses right in front of the boss himself, similar to the Defender's Batak. Here has that blood curdling shout, so you will want to make sure he is kicked. He also has Broad Stomp, which is a frontal attack targeted at the tank that will not follow, so feel free to sidestep that. Valara has Ravaging Spear. This is a random target 4-yard AoE that you'll just want to avoid, as well as Vehement Charge, which is just a random target charge attack that does physical damage and knocks back in a line, so make sure you guys avoid this. And to make this easier, you can try and point this against one of the nearby walls so he doesn't run across this entire area. When one of these mini bosses dies, the other will be enraged with Raging Kin, so you can either kill these mobs close together or have a Soothe ready when one dies. After you've killed these two mini bosses, you'll be able to engage the final boss, Balakar Khan. This fight has two distinct phases as well as a short intermission, but luckily a lot of the abilities in both of the phases are quite similar. For tanks, he has a combo of Rending Strike followed by Savage Strike, where the first here is a big physical hit that applies a 10 second bleed that also amps Savage Strike's damage by 500% and the second is just a smaller physical hit, but of course, it gets that 500% damage amp, so make sure you do have something that covers both of these. Occasionally, a player will be targeted with Iron Spear. This deals damage to anyone within 7 yards of them, so you want to bring this out of the group, and then once that spear is actually thrown, the boss will then charge towards it, dealing physical damage to anyone in the path and knocking them back, so watch out for this. On top of this, the boss will do a random target frontal attack in upheaval, and at the same time, will put quake circles around every single player that will splash within 5 yards, so you want to avoid the cone and then spread out. Once the boss reaches 60% HP, he'll run towards the front of the room, become immune to damage, and cause storm winds to happen. This just deals constant ticking damage and has a light pushback as well. At the same time, four Nokud Stormcasters become active and you'll need to defeat all of them in order to get rid of this ticking damage and begin phase two. All these guys do is just spam a random target interruptible cast in Stormbolt, so just kick these, scoop the mobs up, use AoE CCs, and just cleave them down. When phase 2 starts, the boss will use similar abilities to phase 1, but they're all empowered by lightning. The tank combo hits and dot now become nature damage, as does the random target spear. On top of this, the spear will also now grip the entire party to the area it hits when it's thrown, and everyone will then have to dodge the incoming charge attack. The frontal cone is also, you guessed it, nature damage, as are the 5 yard circles around players, though again, in this phase, these will now do an additional thing in leaving a puddle behind in that 5 yard area so it has some area denial attached to it. That wasn't enough, throughout this phase just lightning swirlies will be spawning all around the room under players in random places, you just need to avoid these. That is it for the trash and boss abilities though, so let's get into my simple pug friendly route here in MDT. I'll post a link to this down in the description as well if you want to grab it for your own use. Starting off the bat here, we're going over towards Granis area in this place, and here you really only want to clear the trash that you absolutely have to. Uh, you have, of course, the three Lance Master packs. Uh, there's also the small three pack patrol that is usually patrolling right towards this pack, so I recommend doing that pull first. Be careful when grouping because there are two longbows, and those guys don't really want to move, so use some form of displacement to kind of group those guys up and watch those frontals. And the only other pack you're killing in this area is this patrol here that goes all around the entire boss area. There is this patrol that goes around the outside of the area, but this pack is very, very nasty. Highly recommend avoiding this, especially be careful when it passes by pull number three here. Be careful. Once the boss is dead, make your way towards the lightning area, landing around by pull six. This is a storm caller and a totem pull. Uh, you can then make your way towards the other storm caller and totem pull here. Uh, you can pull some of these mobs patrolling around the middle. There's a group of primal gusts. Pretty easy to deal with, as well as one Thunder Beast plus two Storm Shields patrolling around this area as well. Uh, kind of difficult to deal with the boss with those guys there, that's why we kill them. Then you have the other Stormcaller pull, and then you can drag and ride up and over all these mobs here, 
to pull number 10 and then drag and ride back down to the bosses. Let's you skip all this kind of annoying trash, particularly the storm shields here, uh, combined with any of this other pulls. Like pulling storm shields into this pack could be a little spooky uh, in a pug group, especially if you're not sure if you have a purge uh, or if the person's going to even use their purge, right? So I recommend just jumping over all these guys, doing pull 10, then doing the boss, then you move up to the graveyard area. Uh, so this first pull, uh, you want to grab these two guys down uh, here. I've added in the patrol here. Very hard to see, actually. So there's like a three-pack of birds that fly around this entire area. It actually doesn't really matter which pull that you add them to. You could add them to any of pull 12, 14, 15, or 19, uh, or, or 17 even. Like, any of these pulls are just fine to add them to. doesn't really matter which, just wherever you get them, because they don't add too much difficulty. They just have that tank uh, aimed frontal. Uh, but you're basically killing all the trash here because this is actually some of the more uh, easier trash to deal with. There's a lot of unavoidable damage uh, in these packs with the lightning abilities and much more deadlier abilities in these packs. Whereas in this area, like some most of the kicks are like uh, tank targeted. So if you have a good tank player, they'll be just fine. If people are missing kicks, uh, a lot of these uh, abilities don't really do much. So you don't have to stop them right in that, that three yard swirly AOE, right? If you don't stop it, there's just some swirlies going out. You can just not stand in them, right? I really do think this is the easiest trash in the dungeon right now. And so that's why I'm pulling literally all of it here and just uh, adjust these pulls as you kind of see fit, right? If you think this pull is too big, if you think this pull is too small, you're like, yeah, I'm going to pull twice that. Go ahead. I believe in you. But basically the way percents work out, we're killing literally everything in this area. Uh, note the order I kill this in though. I go 12, 14, 15, uh, this pack right here. And then I do this other soul harvester uh, because there is some RP on the boss here. And so once you kill the soul harvester, you can just have one person quickly drag and ride over to start the RP. And then you can continue pulling these last couple packs. Once you kill them, you go to the uh, final boss area. Be careful when you're flying in here. You want to fly like towards this way and around this way. I can, I can draw. You want to fly this way. The problem is if you fly this way on beta, you would get that area around the hold, like I told you, where you're not able to actually fly. Uh, and if you were over here, it would actually like eject you to like this way. Whereas if you accidentally like trigger it over here, for example, it would eject you to the normal spot like down here. So just keep that in mind, how you're flying to this hold. It can be uh, a tad bit annoying if you get ejected all the way back to the Tira and Maruk area and not over here. So just be careful. Uh, but again, once you're in this area, all this trash here is actually completely skippable without the use of Invis Pots or Rogue Shroud. So there's a gate uh, here that you can jump over. You can jump over this gate and just kind of hug up here. And similarly, you can jump over a gate over here past these guys. And then whichever side of the road these guys are on, you can then cross like left or right afterwards and like go either this way around or this way around, depending on where their pad is. And, and you can skip all this trash just by running. Again, do not drag and ride in this area. You'll get ejected. Not good. You can mount up, just you can't drag and ride fly into the air. Then you just got the twins. You have a pretty decent room here to deal with. But again, you're not pulling anything uh, outside of this little ring that you're going to be in for this trash. So try and aim them so they don't like charge way out and pull some more trash, right? Be careful of where you're actually aiming those charges. Then you just have the last boss. There we have it, guys, my complete Mythic Plus guide to the Nokud Offensive. As I mentioned before, got a ton of Mythic Plus and raid content coming over the next several weeks, including advanced routing guides, high key walkthroughs from a tank perspective, Mythic raid guides, and so much more. So make sure you do hit that subscribe button. It's free to do, and I really do appreciate all the support. If you have any questions at all, please leave those down in the comments below or come stop by my Twitch channel at Tactics, and I'll do my best to answer. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.